Hey traders, David Frost, my strategic forecast. You're here for another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis. Today is Monday, October 4, 2021. We're looking at a daily chart of the SPY or Spider, which is the proxy for the S&P 500. What do we have on the docket today? We're going to take a look around the horn at a lot of different charts, a lot of different markets. We're going to look at this thing from a variety of different perspectives. We will be the umpire calling balls and strikes. It's very important that traders who are interested to understand what is actually happening and what is likely to happen going forward, that they pay attention from this point forward. The first thing we do is take a look at the daily chart. We want to know what's jumping off the page. Is anything obvious to us? What's the 426.25 line running across the screen? That was identified today as a important number, which means it A, will be supportive of the market if reached in the manner in which we like them to be reached. We don't want them to creep into the market. We don't want them to eat time off the clock above that particular price. In this case, they came up a few pennies short, but we'll get to that later. As far as the daily chart is concerned, let's take it from the last couple of days and we'll go back from there. So Friday, they had a nice rally. They came up short of this same price, and they closed back above the 100-period moving average after making a new low, giving the appearance that that was going to be some kind of interim low. However, maybe it was going to, maybe it still will be, meaning maybe we won't get a close below that low. They obviously didn't close below it today. But this is the way the market works when it gets into these corrective phases. A, It's sponsored by the Trick Trap Fool and Frustrate Crew. Their job is to make as many traders and investors look like fools as much of the time as possible. So a la, that's what they were doing on Friday. You don't know it at the time. They could have easily had follow through today. We don't know what we don't know until we have clues. Where do we get clues from? We get clues from time and price. A, Time is more important than price. B, are they below an important price, which becomes resistance? Are they above an important price, which becomes support? That's the way we take what's happening on the daily charts and the weekly charts and the monthly charts, and we drill down to what happens intraday from shorter time frames. Things morph from shorter time frames to larger time frames. Case in point. Just for illustration purposes, go back to this spot on the daily chart from the 27th of August. That low represents a breakup candle low. So we know one thing. Once price closes below that breakup candle low, it's susceptible to go to the next important number, wherever that may be. Doesn't guarantee we're going there, but the doorway opens to go get that number. Another area of interest is this low here from the 19th of August. That low is 436.12. We're below that low. Now that becomes resistance on the way back up. Can they get back above that number? Maybe, maybe not. But when they get to that number, it's generally speaking A, magnetic, so it draws price in if they're close, and B, becomes overhead resistance until such time as they can begin closing candles above. Short-term candles, hourly candles, two-hour candles, four-hour candles, a daily candle, and so on. That's the way the market works. So just as a point of interest, we flip over to the monthly chart, and we see what was going on on a daily chart. We see some important numbers. They got below them. Now they can't get back above. And what happens? It created a monthly reversal candle last month. Will they try and rally up this breakdown candle at least part of the way? They may. They may not. We don't know yet until we know. But this is how shorter time frames begin to morph onto other charts, and they give us additional stuff to consider. They give us more information. Now, we have a reversal candle on a monthly chart. I didn't have that before, so it's one more piece of data that I have in my tool belt. Let's say they don't, meaning they don't go higher at any point in the near term. 
Well, guess what? Then the reversal candle that took place in the month of September will mark a top in the market. If they close a monthly candle above last month's high, then that will take that scenario off the table. Under normal garden variety conditions, you have a reversal candle. The majority of time, it's going to be a duck. Sometimes they won't work. The majority of time, using the 80-20 rule, they will work. So, therefore, we're going to say the majority of time, this type of reversal candle will mark a reversal in the market, and the fact that we have it at a high means that September could mark a top. We're putting a line in the sand. We've got a stake in the ground through September. Staying with the daily chart for a moment, let's just pick out another spot. So we have a breakup candle, and the low here is 424.83. We're going to round it up to, say, 425. And then we move over to the left, and we notice when price ran up to this spot over here, it was rejected. Albeit only for a few days, but it still got rejected at that price, finally broke out above that price, did come back to retest it. We've been over this before, but here we are again at a big fat round number of 425, not that we're there today, but we're close, 425, a breakup candle low, the same breakout area they've already run a test of. So what are we going to do with that information? Couple of things. Here's the way I am reading it. So they're not coming straight into 425, for example. They're essentially creeping into it. Let's assume for a second, for the purposes of this hypothetical, they're going to continue a little lower. So they've been creeping in, and they've already run a test of that spot, and they found a low today above a number that today, for me, was important. Just albeit a few pennies above 426.25, the low today happens to be 426.36. So that was important today, not necessarily the breakup candle low. This number was important for a different reason. Remember, time is more important than price, and we're going to get to more of that a little bit later, and we're going to explain how that comes together from an intraday perspective, not only on the daily chart or weekly chart or another chart. So what I'm saying about that 425 is I'm not that enthralled with 425 at this point, having come up short of today's number and having creeped down to this particular area. Here's the caveat. We're the umpire calling balls and strikes. Here's a term that I absolutely hate, which is the market is oversold. What does that mean? It means it's down a lot. We really don't have a measurement for oversold because how much does it get oversold before it snaps back? And there is no answer. The more oversold it gets, we get into the rubber band discussion. We've had this discussion a lot. We had it last week. You can stretch a rubber band and you can stretch it and stretch it and stretch it. And the majority of the time, using the 80-20 rule, the market's going to snap back. You're going to have a short covering rally, a short squeeze. You're going to get a tremendous opportunity if you can catch the low, even in the vicinity of the low. However, sometimes, using the 80-20 rule in the minority of the time, sometimes the rubber band's going to snap and you're going to get another leg lower that nobody saw coming. As a just-in-caser, and I'm not saying this is happening tomorrow, it may not happen for several weeks, and if it does, then the number's going to change. But in the near term, if the rubber band broke, where would they go? Here's a weekly chart. You're looking at the 50-week moving average. It's a give or take. Maybe they pull up short. Maybe they spike it through. But that 405 area really is the spot. It's Hard to imagine they could get there in a hurry, and they may not anytime soon. However, if the thing snapped and they started getting below 422, for argument's sake, the door begins to crack open. Write that down on a sticky note. Here's a 240 chart. We just want to get a snapshot, see if there's anything material that we don't see on the daily chart. And here, there's a couple of things that we can learn from. So let's start here with this big breakdown candle from the 30th. So what did they do over here on the 1st? They ran up to run a test around the high of the breakdown candle. There, they failed. So on the first run, 
under normal garden variety conditions, you're going to get at least a pullback from the high of a breakdown candle. Now, they didn't get to the high. They got in the vicinity of the high, but that counts. It's the general area. It's the concept of how the market works. Now, that number is 436. Here's a line across the screen. We know that number from last week. It was important. And let's just see what happened as they approached that number from a shorter time frame, a shorter perspective. Here's a 10-minute chart, and this is the same price. You can see what happened when they got to that price. It was at the end of the day. They had a rally for the majority of the day starting around 10.50 in the morning. Now, if you're just looking at a short-term chart, 5-minute chart, 10-minute chart, 1-minute chart, whatever you look at, when they get up to this price up here around 436, are you thinking that they're going to run into resistance or are you thinking they're going to keep going into the end of the day? If you're not aware of or paying attention to the other charts, you don't really necessarily know exactly where the necessary resistance points or the important areas are. Food for thought, write that down. Here's another item on the 240 chart. This is on all the charts, but I think this is interesting. There are no accidents or coincidences. Here's the low from Friday, 427.23. Here's the close of this 240-minute candle, 427.23. Now keep in mind, it's a 240-minute candle. So it's trading all the time, and then all of a sudden, by chance, by the stroke of luck, at the end of this 240-minute candle, it closes right on the number, which was the low from last Friday. Are there any accidents or coincidences? I think not. Now you have another big breakdown candle. Is this thing stair-stepping down to where we're going to see a rally to challenge or run up to, at least in the neighborhood of this breakdown candle high or in that ballpark, and then they're going to hit him again? Is that what's going on? That's a possibility. 433, 434. If they're up in that neighborhood, they're above the big fat round number of 430. ES 4300, things look like they're in a repair operation status. And at the time, what they would be doing is running another test of another breakdown candle high. Now, if they get above, that's one thing. If they can't, then it was a simple garden variety test. You see how this works? Over and over and over again. If they don't do that and they start lower, then we have other numbers beneath in the southbound lane inside the number members will have those first thing in the morning if need be. No new information on the 120 minute chart, nothing different than we just discussed. But the hourly chart does have something of interest. You have to go back to the course, lazy e-mini trader. You have to think to yourself, what's in there? Time is more important than price. Guess what? There was a trade today based on time is more important than price. This is an afternoon trade. It's trader's choice, of course. I can give you the information. I can tell you what the scoop is. It's obvious you can trade it against the low. It's putting on risk. It's trader's choice. But more often than not, using the 80-20 rule, when the market is on time, you're going to get some kind of a trend change. Let's start smack in the middle of inside the numbers. 140 post, if they're going to get going, now would be the time, if you know what I mean. That's speaking to traders that have taken the course, lazy e-mini trader. Now, where are we on the chart when that takes place? So here is the candle ending 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon. The next candle ends at 2.30. So somewhere in this neighborhood, about 427.50, 427.60, give or take, in that neighborhood, down in this zone, is where we notice that the market may be making a turn and it's on time. Now, we don't know exactly how long it's going to take to rally all the way up. We don't know that it will rally all the way up. But what we do know is the odds favor you're going to get a trend change and they're going to want to go make a test of another important number north of current price. If they get below a certain number, we know that would be wrong, and there would be something different developing and a different number on the table in the southbound lane. 
getting above 428 and a quarter and closing candles above opens the door for a test of 430, give or take. That might have been a little aggressive in terms of the target at 430, but let's go back to the chart and see what happened. There's a five minute chart, 428 and a quarter, and that's the number. You can see they try and get above and they fail. They try and get above and they fail. And then all of a sudden, at the end of the day, mysteriously, they close above in the last couple of minutes of the day. That's an important spot. Maybe they just ran out of time and they'll be back to 430 or the big fat round numbers in the morning. They did get to a high of 429.22, but they didn't get any higher than that. Close, but no Cuban cigar. Let's go back to the beginning of Inside the Numbers. We'll run through the early thoughts. We'll run through the rest of the commentary, circle back to stocks on the move. The first thing on our mind this morning was, was it a relief rally or are we going to see follow through from Friday? They rallied them overnight. They failed early in the morning. Smelled somewhat like a dead cat bounce. We don't know. We come in with no bias early in the morning, especially on a Monday morning. Start off the week with an open mind. 432.25 is the key spot this morning. Opening below, below 432 and a quarter, or getting below, opens the door for a garden variety test of 430.50, give or take. Then we have the flip side stuff. We don't need the flip side stuff. Here's a five minute chart, right of the vertical is today's activity. Here's the opening print, 433. 432 and a quarter is the first line here. They come into it, they bounce off of it. It is a bounce, but then they fail. And guess what? They also failed at 430.50, which in my world was supposed to be support today that was incorrect. Let's scroll up, and what you'll see is that I did take a trade around that price, and guess what? It was a personal shitburger. It happens. It's part of the business. But here's what I do know. If I exercise patience, there's likely another trade around the corner. In fact, that's yet not to have happened. Doesn't necessarily have to be in the same day. It's nice when it does come in the same day. There's always another trade around the corner. Today, there was an afternoon trade around the corner. It's the one we went over earlier. So as far as the spider is concerned, first trade was a winner, second trade was a loser, third trade was a winner, two for three. Not what I had in mind coming into the day, but I have the awareness that that does happen and therefore we accept it and we move on. Side note, sometimes as a trader, one of the hardest things we can do or we have to do is admit when we're wrong. When we're wrong, that means we have to take a loss. It's a very difficult thing to do because we have in the back of our mind that it's gonna come back. We want it to come back, we're hopeful that it'll come back, but we're trading on hopium if we just stay in a trade that didn't do the thing it was supposed to do. All of a sudden, it's doing something different, which means it was wrong, which means the best thing to do is to cut and run. Also, keep this in mind, this is an old trader thing, your first loss is your best loss. It's not gonna work out like that 100% of the time, but what I can tell you is, if you do that, if you exercise that thing, first loss, best loss, move on. If you can get that in your head and actually do it, when you realize the trade is wrong, you cut and run, you're going to save yourself a whole lot of times where that $200 loss or $300 loss or $500 loss doesn't become the $1,200, the $1,500, the $2,500. You know the drill. It's the one you end up glued to watching all day long trading on hopium. If it's wrong, you cut and run, you give yourself a chance to get it back later if there's enough time left on the clock. You're not gonna revenge trade or anything, but if something comes up, remember there's always another trade around the corner. You put it out of your mind, you move on. And I will tell you, again, another side note, this is like side note 2B. If you don't put it out of your mind, A, you're not gonna be able to take the next trade and C, if you do take the next trade, you're gonna be gun shy and you're gonna have a quick trigger finger anyway. Each trade is independent of one another. The current trade has nothing to do with the last one. The people fighting you on this trade weren't the same group 
that was fighting you on the last trade. Think of it that way. All right, let's move on. Let me run through the commentary. I told you exactly what happened. You saw the numbers. I'll run through the commentary. Those interested will pause the video, go back to the charts, read the notes, double check the work, see where there's learning opportunities, see where the numbers are, see why things are mentioned. And not only why they're mentioned, but why they're mentioned, when they're mentioned. For example, the market's on time. Well, all of a sudden, out of the blue in the afternoon, I'm telling you, hey, it's on time, therefore, it's ripe for a turn. We don't know for a fact that it's going to turn, but it's the setup we're interested in. It can turn. We've got the awareness that under normal market conditions, using the 80-20 rule, she's going to turn. What about stocks on the move? We had a healthy list today. We're going to look at the ones that hit their price targets or entry objectives, not the ones that didn't. We don't care about those. We want them at our numbers, not somebody else's. We're going to look at BABA. We're going to look at W, which is Wayfair. We're going to look at IIVI. Get that one. I love that symbol. We've traded this before. I put it up on the board. I love that symbol. And not least, but last, we're going to take a look at MRNA, give you a hint. There was a little bit of a rocket ride involved in this one. BABA, 138.66 was today's number. 138.66, slightly below, was in fact support today. I wasn't in love with how this thing did it. I didn't take this trade because I didn't like how it came into it. If it did it around here before, let's say, 10 o'clock in the morning, that's one thing. But when they ran time off the clock and creeped into it, I just took a pass. These type of trades become trader's choice. Some of them will work. Some of them will work wonderfully. Others won't work. I prefer them come straight in. That's how I do it. I can only give you the benefit of how I prefer to take the trades. I give you the numbers. The numbers are going to work the majority of the time. They work best for a trade when price comes straight into them. Write that down. Put it on a sticky note. Wayfair, same routine. They come down. They have a tremendous rocket ride away from higher than the number. Then they come into the number. At that point, I'm not even watching it anymore. And you can see what happened. They closed below the number after eating a bunch of time off the clock. So it's one of those, glad they didn't take it. There's lower somewhere to go. I-I-V-I, no idea what this company is. Don't care. The numbers on the board were 56.90, 55.75, painting by the numbers, worked out. You can see what happened. Slice through the first one, that wasn't the deal. The second one was the deal, and you know the drill. When they're close together, I can make an equal case it's one or the other. It was the bottom number. They had a rocket right away from the bottom. Your average is somewhere in the middle if you're painting by the numbers. 56.34, 56.35. Minutes later, here they are making a high of 57.42. That's all we're looking for. Some of them give you the secondary rocket ride. Base hits put you in the Hall of Fame. Doubles and triples get you the big bucks too. Moderna, how you doing? 307.79. The low in the first candle of the day, the first 15-minute candle, was really like in the first minute, was 305. Here's a one-minute chart. Now, I recognize there's not a ton of traders that will trade a $300 stock, let alone Moderna at $300. I get that, but there were some. I'm going to put the numbers up on the board. You don't have to trade it, but there are certainly traders that want this price. They want Moderna. They know that if it's the right price, they're going to get a rocket ride. If it's the wrong price, they're stepping out on the risk scale, and they're going to have to take a hit. They know that. A $300 stock, especially one in the news like Moderna, is going to be a mover. The stock was $330 by 10.30 in the morning. $330.56. After the first three or four bucks, it becomes trader's choice. If a trader is willing to hold what we call a trailer, you can get another chunk out of it. It's also what we call a risk-free, emotionless trade if you've taken a profit and you've got a stop or at least a mental stop in the money or worst case, break even, which is what you paid for it. What's going on over in Camp IWM? 
So there's a couple of interesting things going on. Let's focus for a second on Friday's low. That's this candle here. So we had that little reversal on Friday. They had a good day. And here, they didn't get below Friday's low in the IWM, but they did get below Friday's low in the S&P 500. So that's interesting. Why is that interesting? Because the IWM is my favorite market leading indicator. A lot of times, it's going to give a tip off what's coming next whether it's on the south side or the north side. Not every time, but we take notice of things like that. Well, do we have anything else that we can take notice of, which is a thing like that? Well, if we have to, we're going to take notice of this. We have a low. We have a higher low. We have a higher low. We have a higher low today, and this is only one day removed from Friday, but it's still a higher low. We have to contend with these moving averages, but yet at the same time, this is not the same position as the S&P 500. Maybe they fail, and that's fine. But right now, they're not failing. They have higher lows. We have to be aware of that. You must be the umpire calling balls and strikes. And by the way, I didn't mean to leave this one out over here, but the low here is 209.05, and the low here is 210.68, so the higher lows go all the way back to July. On the weekly chart, they're riding the 20-week moving average, so we don't necessarily need to pay too much attention to the 20-week because they're back and forth, slicing and dicing through it week in, week out. But look what's going on with the 50-week moving average. It's creeping up to price. So essentially, as price ran sideways and ate time off the clock, forget the 20-week moving average, the 50-week sloped into price. Now, if they get below the 50-week and below this pivot, good night, Irene, but what if the 50-week is supportive of price and these higher lows are more meaningful than meets the eye? We'll know that if they recapture these moving averages. If we find price back above these four moving averages, so we'll call it back above 223 and change, and they start closing daily back above there, you better watch out for a short squeeze in the northern direction. Umpire, call on them on the black. What about the folks down at the transportation department? Well, they're not strong, they are weak, they're below all the moving averages, and they're hovering over the next number, which is starting to diminish the importance of 13,630. We talked about that when it was on its way down, they bounced, now they've hovered over it for a period of time which begins to diminish the supportive nature, naturally, of 13,630. Again, in order to get anything going like a repair operation in the transports, 14,760 is needed. There's certainly another number before that, and it would be this pivot here, 14,588. You start getting above that pivot, and it's likely not only will you test 14,760, but you'll likely eclipse it as well. Remember, it was all the way back in May that the transports topped out while other markets were still making new highs, hence the reason why I call this the canary in the coal mine. It was a one more time the canary in the coal mine. I can't tell you how many times the transports gave the tip off over the long term of a long term shift in the tape, in either direction. What about the folks at in Silicon Valley, the Q people, and what the hell is that line on the screen? I'll get to that in a moment. Most of you already know what that is. They're also in that rubber band type status. If they got taken out behind the woodshed, would the 200 period moving average be the spot? It may be, but my spot is more like 330. Not saying the rubber band breaks, but I'm saying if it did, you should note around 3.30. By the way, we can also, at any point in time, get a rip-your-face-off rally in all these markets, and they'll go up hard, fast, and chunks of points in a short period of time. That's what happens in the corrective phases. You will get wild swings in both directions, you'll get big drops, and you'll get the rip-your-face-off rallies. Now let's talk about this line. So whether it's in the media, on blogs, whether it's people sending me, like you guys, sending me charts saying, hey, 
What about the head and shoulders pattern on the cues? Well, now that we've talked about the elephant in the room, let's talk about the elephant in the room. Here you have a potential head and shoulders pattern. There's a left shoulder, there's a head, there's a right shoulder, there's your neckline, and it was broken last week. Now what you have to expect is to rally back to run a test of the neckline. Now, A, a lot of these fail. The more people that start talking about them, the more charts that get sent around the internet, if they start talking about it in the media, they're like destined to fail. So here's what you have to watch out for. If you get a run back to the neckline, where's the neckline? So let's get kind of a area where the neckline is. So around one or 361 and change. Let's say you get a rip your face off rally. It looks like things are great. The NASDAQ's up six, seven, eight points, meaning the Qs, maybe 10 points in one day, whatever it is. Now, all of a sudden, here they go. They're retesting the neckline. That's natural garden variety, the way the market works. So A, you'd be in the midst of a rip your face off rally. B, you'd be running a test of an important spot. And C, let's say they closed back above the neckline on the day. And then another day, guess what? You're going to get a short squeeze right up into these moving averages before you can say, what the fuck happened? Or if you can't close back above the neckline and they run a test, they have the ability to fall away and do this like really, really fast. How do you figure out the target of a head and shoulders pattern? It's taught of the course and lazy e-mini trader, among a lot of other things, like time is more important than price, a la what we talked about before. What about the financials, the XLF? So they're above all the moving averages. They had a reversal day, meaning they tried to rally. They failed, finished near the lows, but they're above all the moving averages. So from a daily chart perspective, we're just going to say above all the moving averages, there's nothing wrong with this chart. They start getting below 36, give or take. There's something wrong with the chart. Basically, nothing's changed from what we've been saying. What about Smash Mouth? What's that line at 228.15? Well, that's the giveaway. That's the, they're killing the tape, everything's out behind the woodshed, shot three times type of number. That's the rubber band breaking number. Doesn't have to happen in one day. It's just the rubber band breaking number. That's the area that you step in and buy the thing with like four hands. And you trade it against daily closes below 224. That's the trade. This is if they do it in a hurry. But Smash Mouth down 253, meaning in percentage terms. That's a big day on the downside. So the Smash Mouth, or SMH, Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, that's a pretty good proxy for the tech space, and the cues were taken out behind the woodshed. So is this telling us there's a lot more coming, or are they going to hit the 200-period moving average or come up short and just all of a sudden start bouncing the tape? We talked about higher lows before, but guess what? In the SMH, you had a low, a higher low, you had a series of higher lows, and then all of a sudden, no dice. Now you have a lower low. Changes the thing. Changes the scope, the character, the complexity of the tape. Is it a one-day wonder? Is it shenanigans? They're going to turn it around? Or is the SMH the one telling us there's more downside coming? You have to be aware of this. This is a big awareness. Smash Mouth is a good proxy for the tech space. Tech has been getting taken out behind the woodshed. Smash Mouth is out behind the woodshed. They're going to reverse the market. They're going to have a rip your face off rally, but do they break the rubber band first? If I told you how much I appreciate each and every one of you without you, these videos are not possible. That is true and accurate information. We're going to pull the ripcord here today. I'm David Frost. My strategic forecast Thanks again for tuning in to another episode of Common Sense Market Analysis.